The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Uh, good morning, saints of God and my family uh, in the Lord. Grace and peace be with you all. We're having a good season in the Lord. He's at uh, work in deep and beautiful ways, sanctifying us. I just wish all of you uh, could enjoy what I get to enjoy on a weekly basis. Yesterday I sat with some parents and their son and daughter-in-law who have been estranged for five years with reconciliation, one of the sweetest things, just how warm and beautiful and humble uh, all were, and just seeing the, the beauty of God working. And then last night we had a rehearsal dinner, uh, and one of the families in the churches just took that on because uh, Joe is the, the man getting married, and his uh, dad is very ill, and his mom passed away when he was young, and so this family just uh, took it on, and it's one of the most beautiful rehearsal dinners I've ever been to, and so it was just so beautiful to see their love and the way they just jumped in and served and the whole body of Christ helping. And so to God be the glory for the beauty of what he does uh, in our hearts. I just want to give you kind of a rundown uh, on the music ministry here at the church before I get started. If you're visiting, our worship leader of six years just retired, and he served us so well here at the church, and that a large group of people uh, are wanting to minister in this area. And it, this is encouraging because when we first started the church, I was teaching at the School of Mines, a college study, and so all we had was 90% engineers, which is beautiful, but it was a little bit out of balance. And so now we're, we're starting to get people who use the other side of the brain, and it's just been really neat to watch the balance of what God is doing in our midst. And so looking at this group that we had and all these new people coming, I didn't think we could pull it off that all would be able to serve in this ministry. But as we did assessments, all, all the gifts of where people wanted to serve and where God had led them and their talents that, that God had given to them, uh, just seeing all of that. And then the, the, probably the most important part of what we did is Greg Kurtz and I interviewed every person who wanted to serve in this ministry. And we both had these goosebumps and were weeping and sobbing at the power of God and what He's doing and all the hearts of the people that want to serve in this area and just how much they want God to be glorified and they, they want to be a team. They want to work together for His glory. And so what came up perfectly from all the tryouts and all these things, uh, assessments, uh, was two teams that are going to rotate every week and everyone will get to serve at least once a month, maybe twice and, and so with some continuity as well. And so God just worked mighty and powerfully. And it just all fell together perfectly. And we were worshiping Him for the beauty of what He's done as we move forward in this area. And the hearts and the unity uh, of John 4, just to worship in spirit and in truth. I hope your hearts uh, were full with that as we just sang and as we will worship now through the proclaimed Word of God. I just feel a joy in what God is doing. And then uh, on the, the months where we have five Sundays, uh, Austin Young came up with this idea of it'll be a hymn sing where there'll be less instrumentation and more just the choir of Southside Bible Church. And so just a lot of neat things of what God's going to be doing as we journey. So as one theologian once said, I, I love it when a plan comes together. Uh, I just feel great joy in how God has brought this whole thing uh, together and to Him be the glory for what he does in the church of God. Well, I'd like to give a special welcome to any visitors who might be with us here this morning. Uh, as you heard, we're going to have a, a picnic, and we brought extra food, and we're just planning. If you came and just wanted to come really get to know this body, just uh, come with us to that park that was mentioned. I don't know how to get there, but I'm sure there's a map or something in the back, or ask somebody afterwards. Uh, so we are in between studies. We, we finished up Second Peter, and in three weeks, we're going to begin Habakkuk. And so in that meantime, I get the, the privilege to freelance, which is not safe. I just get to preach whatever's on my heart. And again, I've been a little spunky and feisty, and I think I will be again this morning. So pray for your, your pastor. I just want to review where we've gone. Ephesians 4, we looked at the church. We looked at the, the beauty of God's design of the church. And in verse 16 of chapter 4 of Ephesians, the body causes the growth of the body. All of our giftings and being united in each other's lives, we're going to cause each other to grow up 
into the head and we keep the spirit of the unity so that we can grow and be in each other's lives and keep working together. So there's a humility and a forbearance and a love and a kindness shown to each other. And so uh, then last week we took up John chapter 4. What is true worship? And we saw this living water that Jesus wants to give to satisfy our souls with Him, to unblock locked up hearts to Him so that this living water can flow in and lead us to worship of our God. God is seeking worshipers. That's what He wants. And he, we had a strong exhortation in that. And, and we're not looking for the state of the art, but the state of the heart. And I just, I do, I pray that your worship was in spirit and in truth, that your taste buds have been awakened to love this God and that we're doing it in truth of all that has been done in Jesus Christ and we gathered corporately from all walks of life unified to praise this glorious God in spirit and in truth. Now this morning I want to go deeper in those two subjects and, and seek really to, to shepherd us into green pastures and still waters so that you can drink and that it will go deep into your heart and so I, I don't want it to go so much to deep into your neighbor's heart or your spouse's. I want it to go deep in your heart this morning. I want you to let the Word of God just go into your heart. Let the sword of the Spirit do what it does and come in and teach. There's some beautiful things we're going to look at this morning. And so it's simply this. is How do we hear sermons like the past two weeks on the unity of the Spirit and worship in Spirit and in truth? And you, you say, man, I love that. I want unity of the Spirit. I want worship. I don't want externals. I, I want to worship the living God from my heart. But then someone hurts me, and I'm undone, and I gossip, or I shut down, or I pull away. I, uh, the unity and the testimony of what God designed the church to be is broken, and now we've handled it just like the world. And then we don't seek the person out in love and to work through it, and we close up. Then we say, I want to worship in spirit and truth, pastor. Amen. That lady who was lifting her hands up in front of me, though, made me uncomfortable. The drummer just was a little louder today than he normally is. Jacques. <laughs> that guy ignored me when I walked by, and worship just ends, and it starts to dissipate. You're like, how can that happen <laughs> in spirit and in truth that something like that takes away my worship. Well, why is that? How does that happen? And what we're going to look at this morning is the idols of the heart, that, that they're in the way. Their true worship and true body life, there's idols of the heart that are going to get in the way and mess with these beautiful truths that we've been looking at. And so I've been praying that these idols would be revealed this morning by the truth of God's Word and His Spirit, and that you would see how they've been hurting your growth and maybe your whole life. Your whole life, these idols have been hurting you and keeping you back from body causing the growth of the body and, and just relationship after relationship you keep moving from and church after church. And, and that last week that lady kept moving from spouse to spouse, five husbands and the one you live with isn't it. And you just got these idols and you just keep chasing and looking for things to fill it. it that could be so painful this morning to really open that up and look at it and not keep hiding it, to just stare at it before the living God with His Word. So the design of pain would be that the scalpel this morning might cut off some flesh that has overgrown your heart with these idols. And so I come in love to help every one of you go deeper, deeper to the roots of how do I walk in love with Jesus Christ. And so may this be worship to our God as we throw down every idol. Amen? I, I just want every one of them. Maybe there's some that you're not even aware of, and I'm just asking God before we finish that in grace He would, he would show everyone, and then I'm going to show you the beautiful remedy that God has given us for such idols. So that's a tall order, so let's start by prayer and go to our God and ask Him to meet us and help us. Oh, Father, we, we agree with Calvin. Our hearts are idol factories. God, we are so quick and so prone to worship things other than you. And Lord, there are some of us who just, our lives are, are marred and shipwrecked with conflicts and hurts and jealousies and angers and anxieties because of the idols of our heart. 
And God, we're so prone to work on the flower of sin, but not the root, that we never make progress. We're, we're happy to call out, I have the sin of anger, but we don't want to call out that I've got the sin of pride that rules and reigns in my heart. Uh, my anxiety as I love to control. God, work in every idol here this morning. Come by your word and through your spirit. Open up hearts, not to destroy, but to make to set free and to transform. And so let no one be afraid this morning to open up their heart before the living God because of the beauties of Jesus Christ, this living water that will be able to flow in. God, please do that work in our midst this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll turn with me to 1 John. <clears throat> 1 John. A year ago, almost, the elders preached through 1 John for, I think it was five weeks in just a real survey fashion, and I got to hear some of them, and I just loved it. And uh, the last sermon I got to hear live here was with Greg Kurtz, and he opened up this last verse in First John to me, uh, just b broke open that day in worship when he was preaching. And my mind and my heart have been percolating on that truth for a year. Don't you love that word? Percolating. I <laughs> just been percolating on the beauty and the glory of this last verse in 1 John, and I've just been wanting to preach on it, and uh, because I'm freelancing, I get to this morning, and so I've been prevented, but not this morning, since I'm only preaching on one verse, really. The last line of this epistle, uh, it needs some context, and so I, I, I think it's going to help you get this verse in a, in a beautiful way, and so we need a little history, I think, on who is writing it. It's so important to our understanding of his passionate cry at the end of this epistle, little children, guard yourselves from idols. And it just seems so out of place at the end of this whole letter. He hasn't even mentioned idols in the whole letter, and he closes out with a summary statement. You're like, where did that come from? This amazing letter about doctrine and beholding Christ, and it produces a practice, a righteousness, a love that comes out of a believer now with a strong emphasis on, on love to Christ and love to other people. He has worked it so beautiful through this whole letter and that you just kind of expect him now to just finish it up and go, little children, love one another and just drop his pen. But he does something so unexpected and to me it just seems out of place. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. He hasn't even mentioned that. As a summary statement of everything he's written, he closes out with idols. And I want to go to the heart of why and see if John just had a brain freeze or, or just a hobby horse. Preachers always have hobby horses, and maybe this was it, or just a sidetrack or a spirit-filled, perfect ending to this beautiful epistle, and one that could set us free in a thousand different ways this morning if we understand John's heart logic as he was led by the Spirit of God. And I'm leaning toward that answer is why he said verse 21. To God be the glory. And so let's start with John and look at the big picture then of this letter and narrow it down then into this last verse and make application to how this can deliver me from breaking the unity of the Spirit being led away from being a true worshiper of God and to being the devil's errand boy to disrupt both. My aim is that you would walk in freedom, which is walking in righteousness. So let's just kind of get a little picture of John. John is kind of somewhat familiar to most of us. He's given us five books in the Bible. He gave us the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he also wrote Revelation. And we get so much of his heart in his writings that many of us feel like we know John. You feel like you can get a little closer to John than maybe some of the other writers in the New Testament. And one of John's themes throughout his writings is that of love. Because of John's emphasis on love, I think many have, have a skewed view of this man. Whenever you see art, what, what does John usually look like? You know, can you think of it? Have you seen any pictures? He's usually very wimpish. Uh, and almost effeminate in every picture that I've ever seen of the Apostle John. And I just want to tell you what Scripture reveals of him. He was James's brother, and this is the one Christ gave him a little nickname. You know what that nickname was? Uh, the Sons of Thunder. That's not because he's wimpy. The, the Sons of Thunder, that's a beautiful nickname. 
This is the one who, who wanted fire from heaven thrown down on the Samaritans. Should we just call fire down on him, Lord? He was a fiery zealot. Yet he was under the tutelage of Christ, and under Christ he became a man full of love, and that is my hope for every one of us this morning. Full of thunder as well for the truth. As this epistle is just powerful and cutting in 1 John, it's just straight. Here it is. He's just a man full of love and truth. We saw in Ephesians 4, speaking the truth in love is necessary if we're going to grow up into the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we got to speak truth, and we got to do it in love. John was one of the inner three of the apostles, Peter and James. He was loved by Christ deeply. Five times in the Gospel of John, he said, the one whom Jesus loved. John had a deep awareness that he was loved by Christ. I really believe that that is what made the man the man he became, is he knew this transforming power of the love of Christ. And if you'll just keep your hand in 1 John, flip over to John chapter 13. <coughs> John chapter 13, the Gospel of John just want to look at a couple of things about John before we dig in to this verse. In John 13, we're, we're at the Last Supper. Jesus has told the apostles, my hour has come, and he's preparing them. And look at verse 21. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. And the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. And there was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And so as they would eat, they would lay on their, their left hand so their right hand could, could eat and, and drink. And so that was the place of honor as John is laying down with his head on the bosom of Jesus Christ. And so he's been given the place of honor. He's been given the best place, the breast of Christ. That is better than a throne. John has the nearness of Jesus Christ. And so the blessing of being loved by Christ, the nearness of it. And now more, more than one head can lay on the breast of Christ. All of us, because of this gospel, can lay at the bosom of Christ. By faith, we can all have this place of honor. We, he can dwell in our hearts and we have been joined to him in union and communion. And so we have the nearness, we have that, the nearest place you can get a vine and a branch to Jesus Christ. And the longer I live, I realize that love cannot be content to love at a distance. It, it desires nearness. The love of Christ cries nearer, O oh God, nearer. I just want to be closer to you. John is our example in this. No one basked in the love of Christ more than John. Can't you just picture him uh, taking this in a, a, as a meal? For some reason, I, I picture John doing this at every meal that they had. I think of when, when, when Kayla just got married here a few weeks ago, and I, I got a little sentimental uh, just thinking through and nostalgic. And I remember back to her growing up in our home and thinking through it. And one of the memories that came back was Friday night at the Murphy household. That was my favorite night is we would rent some movies and candy and we would sit on the couch and I would get these five little ones that would just snuggle me and Laura for the evening. And I, I didn't really care about what movie. I mean, I've seen some of the Princess Diaries, some of the dumbest things ever made, but I just got to sit there snuggling these little kids. It was my favorite night. Nearness. Nearness is the cry of love and love near Christ. Come near. Love cannot be content to love Christ at a distance. And John was the one, he just had that nearness to Christ. He, he was always drawing near to his Savior. Flip over to John chapter 19. We're going to look at verse 25. Uh, this is when Jesus is arrested. He's going to be crucified and we're told that John is standing there at the cross and all the other disciples had fled. Uh, maybe Peter, of course, was there. But I just want to read to you this, this beautiful passage why Christ is hanging on the cross in verse 25. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. 
when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her in to his own household. And so here's the compassion of Christ as every drop of blood is now being drained for sinners, his own mother's heart is being pierced like Simeon prophesied. Your heart's going to be pierced, Mary. And here it is being pierced. And Jesus is not indifferent to her. He puts her in the care of John, the, the, the best one. Here, John, John of love. Mary, here's, here's your, your son. John, here's your mother. Take care of her. And all the accounts I studied tell us that John never left Mary until she died. He was faithful to love and nurture his mother to the very end. Flip over to John 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the tomb already taken away uh, from the tomb, the stone. And so she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, <coughs> they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. And so Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb and the two were running together and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter. It's just like a man. He had to say who was faster. You know, I outran Peter and I got to the tomb first and stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrapping, wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and they entered the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled it up in a place by itself. And so the other disciple who had first come to the tomb, John, when they entered, he saw and he believed. The fruit of intimacy with Christ is we believe the word of Christ. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and they're ready to take Christ at his word. And when he saw that he had been raised... John believed nearness and communion breed deeper and stronger faith. Communion makes this word a living word to you. And when he speaks, you hear and you have a receptivity to his word and a willingness and delight in believing. And so what an example this man is to us. The raw material was a son of thunder, full of revenge and self-seeking. The finished product of Jesus working with him was a man who was full of love and truth. And that is growing up into our head. That is the beauty, is this love and truth. He's growing up into Christ and he is growing others. He's a father now to the church and they're growing up into Christ. And so what I'm seeing then as I come to 1 John is John could not get over the love of Christ. And in five New Testament books, I want you to hear this. He uses the word love 80 times. How does a son of thunder become this? And I think the answer is simple. Jesus taught John how to love by loving him the way he wanted him to love. John drank up the love of Christ, and now he's manifesting the love of Christ to this world. And no one true than love more than Jesus Christ. He spoke the truth and he spoke it in love to everyone he talked to. Christ drew John into the most intimate position of all. He loved him. And as John beheld the love of God, it melted him from a son of thunder to a rain cloud showering the world with the love of God in Christ Jesus and proclaiming the truth of this God. He was a man who could not get over the love of God. His theology was simple. He said, God is love. If you get this love, you will love. In 1 John 3.16, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives also for the brethren. You get the love of Christ and your life is going to be laid out for others. There's no in-between for John. This love will melt our hearts and they'll make them loving. It will take hearts that cannot love anything but self and melt them and fill them with love to God and love to other people. It's simple stuff. And I think you get what Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me 
and delivered himself up for me. The life that I live is in the apprehension that I've been loved by Christ. And I mean he called himself the apostle whom Jesus loved. Don't you want to call yourself that? I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. How many of you are comfortable with that tag? That's what we should all be saying. I am the disciple that Jesus loves. George Whitfield, one of the great preachers in the 17, 1700s, he said the love of Christ constrained him. He preached 38,000 times in his life. Sometimes he preached 40 hours in a week. And it was not his love that constrained him. He said it was Christ's love that constrained him. Samuel Rutherford, the great saint of the 1600s, said he had a conscious awareness that he was loved by Christ. And then the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.14, for the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And so he's saying, if you comprehend this love, you won't live in sin. You won't desire to stay in impurity. You can't walk, John says, continually in unrighteousness. This love and what God has done will bring you to repentance. It will always break you. You can't enjoy sin anymore because of the love of Christ. Get this love and you get this glorious liberty to live to him and in him and for him. And so we must have a sense of His love. We need it shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit in Romans 5. We must desire to grow in this sense by studying the Word of God and seeing the objective truths in the Spirit making it subjective to our hearts. We keep ourselves, said Paul to Jew, in the love of Christ. (coughs) The other key in John's writings is he used 70 times the word witness or some synonym And this is what the whole ministry was built on, was the witness of his nearness to Christ. Love that comes from the nearness of Christ. And I'll tell you plainly that those who have been impressed with the love of Christ are the most bold witnesses I've ever seen. The ones who are taken over by this love, it just comes out of them. They're bold. They, They have to speak of this Christ. And that's what you see in John. He is bold. He's in his 90s and he's still thundering out the truth and love. And as a result, he's banished to a small island called Patmos. And there he's speaking the truth in love. And it was more than this world could handle. And as one full of grace and truth like Jesus, he was crucified. So they said, John, we've got to get rid of him. Send him to Patmos. And he died in 98 AD. And tradition tells us he was famous for this. He would say, my little children love one another. He could never get over the love that he had found in Christ. And now he's laying at the bosom of Christ once again, even this morning, beholding his glory and his beauty. And so now if you'll flip over to 1 John, uh, that's your big broad outline. So that was a little longer introduction than normal for me. But I feel like we know this guy now. And now I want to hear, John, what are you talking about in 1 John? Now let's look at the epistle that he wrote called 1 John. So I want you to flip to the beginning, chapter 1. <clears throat> There's just the beginning and the end. I want you to see how he begins this letter and how he ends this letter. They're just bookended. What was from the beginning, what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes and what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, Jesus. And that Life was manifested. It came into the world. And we have seen and we testify and we proclaim to you with a definite article, the eternal life. The one who gives eternal life, we declare and proclaim him to you, which was with the Father. So he he existed before, he was God, and he existed with the Father. And he, that one, was manifested to us here on earth. He was incarnated into this world, fully God and fully man. And in verse 3, what we have seen and heard from this Christ, we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. I, I saw this Christ. He, he was God's Son. 
And he came into this world and, and we beheld him and we walked with him and we loved him and we heard his words. God entered into this world and he came to be a savior of this world. And that is what took up the heart of John. Flip over to 1 John 4.16. And we have come to know experientially and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. We've come to know this love. So here he is, he entered the world and John's saying now as Christians, we, we've come to know this love. The love that I'm writing about, we've come to know it. I know it experientially. I've tasted it. And then just look what he says as he closes out this letter in chapter 5, verse 18. We know that no one who is born of God sins. It's a present tense. No one who is born of God is sinning. You just can't keep living the same way you were when you were an Adam. You're just not going to be doing that. If you've been born again, you're, you're new. And you're not going to continue the same way when you were dead in Adam. You just can't keep sinning. But he who was born of God keeps him. He holds him, and the evil one does not touch him. And we know that we are of God, and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come, and he's given us understanding so that we might know him, Christ, who is true. And we are in him. We are in Christ, who is true. And in his son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and this is eternal life. He, he came into the world and, and we've come to know this love. And now he's saying we, he came and he gave us understanding and we're in him. And in this Christ is salvation, the eternal life. We know this Christ. He's come into the world that we can know him. And as we know him, the whole letter of John is you're going to become like him. And God is love. His whole message is you get this in Christ and you're going to be filled with love. The fulfillment of the whole law is just going to flow and you're going to walk different. You're going to love like no one else. You're going to care and this agape is going to just flow out of you. This is what happens when you behold the love of God in Christ Jesus. He has come into this world. John tells us there are false spirits. He told us in his letter that the world lies in verse 19 in the lap of the evil one. This whole world lies in the lap of Satan, the evil one, and he controls it in verse 19. Uh, flip back to 1 John 2. I want you to see the power of this evil one then in this world. <clears throat> I'll show you where we're going. Hang with me. Do not love the world. It's agape. Don't have a sacrificial love for this world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love of God breaks your love for this world. What, what is in this world? The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. Those are the root of all idols. As we're in this world, that what causes idols is the lust of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, what we want, and the boastful pride of life. That's the world, and that's the root of all idolatry. And that's not from the Father, but that is from this world. And the world is passing away, and also its lusts, its desires, these idols, these epithumias that come and take over our hearts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Same thing as what we saw in 2 Peter 1.4. And so here's where I'm going this morning. John saw this Christ. And he is overwhelmed and amazed that he was God. And he heard and saw and touched and, and walked with this Christ. And he's absolutely certain that that's who this was. He came into the world. And I knew him and I walked. He's the Son of God. And we have come to know that he, in verse 414, he's the savior of the world. He came into this world to save it. This is the true God, and this is the true salvation in this Christ. 
And so he closes out with that last word then. And don't let anything ever become more important to you than Jesus Christ. This is him. He's so beautiful and lovely. Don't let something else eclipse this Christ. Don't let anything have more of your heart. Don't let anything have more of your time. Let nothing become bigger in your desires and your pursuits. He's closing out than this lovely, beautiful Christ that has given us everything in the, in the, in, in the, human, in the divine place in Christ Jesus. Don't let anything become bigger than Christ. That's his conclusion. Just, he's so sweet. And I tasted of him, and he was God, and he brought salvation. Just please don't let, don't let something ever become bigger or more important than that. That's how he just closes it out. By this, the children of God, I'm sorry, little children, guard yourselves from idols. So in closing, the unity of the Spirit is the first application in Ephesians is that we're to keep that. And every one of us who are born again say, amen, that's beautiful. Until one of my idols get touched. My reputation. And then we'll throw out the unity of the Spirit. My feelings. My ambitions. My desires. My gifts. My felt needs. And I'm undone. And I get angry, and I get bitter, and I get withdrawn, and I get gossipy. And I'll break the unity every time my idol gets touched. If Christ isn't sweeter than your idol, You'll break the unity every time because only the beauty of Christ will keep me subduing all these things when they come into my life. And yet the reason they're being touched is why. God's bringing them out so you can see them. So they can be smashed at the beauty and the glory of the Jesus Christ that John saw. So what John saw, guys, can break your idols. Nothing else can break an idol of the heart but this glorious, beautiful Christ. It can take a fiery son of thunder and make him the apostle of love who spoke the truth and power and blossomed the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace in the church of God in that first century. When I'm taken up with Christ, the way John was, all I want to do is worship. He wrote Revelation the book of worship. <laughs> He's worthy. Worthy is the Lamb to receive honor and praise and blessing and glory and honor. He's worthy. My idols will lead me away from worship to self-worship. What I want, what I need, I won't give them my life. My life is mine. I will never offer up my body a living sacrifice. I'll give my body to my idols. My life is to serve my idols. God can come along for the ride, but do not touch my idols. What happens when God touches them? What happens when God touches your idols? You get angry at God. You touched my idol, God. I don't like you. You get bitter. You become anxious. All, all of my idol of my self-control and me being in charge, I'm anxious now because you hit my idol and showed me I can't do it. I'm disappointed. God can't get my life right. My idol is I know my life. I know what's best. And now I'm just disappointed. Can you feel the heart and the passion of John as he closes out this letter? Southside Bible Church. Guard yourselves from idols. Guard yourself from these things. So when these flare-ups come from being faithful in the body of Christ... The easiest thing I've ever done in my life was love the body of Christ from a distance. It's so easy. Just love you. You're adorable. Sweet. Nice. And pray for me. <laughs> Get near. Get near. And you'll know what it'll be like. I sat with a brother last week and we were praying before the service and he was just sobbing before God. Saying, God, help me to quit judging the body of Christ and love it 
and all of its warts. And this is a man serving this body like nobody I know. You get in and you dig into each other's lives and you'll begin to see how hard it is to keep the unity of the Spirit. And when it flares, get alone with God and ask Him, what is my idol? That's why God's doing it in your life. And it's, what is my functional idol? Right? What is my idols that bear fruit like anger? Don't just be saying, I'm an angry guy. What is the root of why I'm an angry guy? What's making me so angry? I just battle jealousy. What's the root of jealousy? What is the idol that's making you jealous? I got pride. What, what, is, the, what is the idol there? I have fear. What are you afraid of? There's an idol that's causing you to be full of fear. Your anxieties. They're just, they're just idols. They're just full of idols. And that's why I'm so anxious. My lusts are idols because God, Christ, isn't enough to me like he was to John. Because he's not enough, I need more. God's holding out. He's not giving me everything I need. I, I lust. I need more because God's not sufficient. Go to the root. Don't settle for the flower of sin. Get to the idol at the root. And that's where John is closing out this letter. Get rid of these idols. Get them away. And the only thing that matters is Jesus Christ and all of His beauty and glory. And those will start breaking and smashing idols. I heard an example from one of my mentors. And I'm going to try to flush this out and make it as practical as possible because I want victory. I want idols smashed for your good and the glory of God. You need these things broken. Some of you are in bondage to your idols and you've had a lifetime of brokenness. And I just, maybe this morning, God brought you here to have idols smashed. This man shared that he went to visit a woman in a mental asylum and she was in a very deep, dark depression. And this woman was a very gifted violinist she never broke into the professional world, and her parents always wanted her to be a great violinist. They paid for everything, the lessons, the violins, and, and she just never made it all the way. <clears throat> but her parents were Christians, and they said, honey, that's okay. You gave it your best. Well done. Good job. But she couldn't forgive herself. She had a thumia, the Greek word for desire. So she, there's a desire. Remember, Thumia can be for a good thing. And she had a good thing. She wanted to give her parents pleasure. And she wanted to give them pleasure by being an accomplished violinist. And what happened to this lady is she wanted to make her parents proud and happy more than anything. And that's when it became an epithumia, an over-desire that, that to her life, her identity became, I got to make my parents happy by being a great violinist. That's got to be my life end and my chief goal. She told this pastor, God has forgiven me. <clears throat> my parents have forgiven me. But I cannot forgive myself. She had made her parents' pleasure, her idol and her God. And a good thing has now become an idol in her heart. And here's the problem. Is that that God cannot forgive you, and it can't love you. Like the beautiful Christ I've just proclaimed to you this morning and that John is writing about in his letter. If you fail it, you'll have depression and guilt and fear and shame. <laughs> I'll be sitting here this morning loaded with that stuff. You see, if you can't get past something or someone, that's become your true identity. Not a child of God. Hold John's whole thing. You've been born again. <clears throat> You're a child of God. It's such you are, he says in 3.1. You don't know yet the fullness of what that means. So I just want you to see that, that your idols cannot forgive you. They will not give you pardon. And when you fail them, they're going to destroy you. Anything but being a child of God uh, in verse 19 of chapter 5 is that you're under the evil one's force. You're under this world system and you're controlled by the evil one. You're owned by this world and your identity will be your idol. Everyone's in this and the devil is giving everyone something to worship other than God. That's his whole plan. I want something else worshiped, anything but God. 
And everyone is taught to find this since you were a little kid. What do you want to be when you grow up, son? And if you come short, your life is blown. I, I talk to people daily on this. My life has been shot because I didn't become that. Well, the new birth, God becomes real to you like he was to John. And I can say I've seen him and I've touched him and I've walked with him. I know this Christ and I fellowship with him. And he becomes your ultimate approval in what you want. And you have it. He forgives you when you come short. You know what he says in 1 John 1 when he starts out in verse 8? If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know what that means? You're going to blow it. You're going to sin. But if we confess our sins... He, God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and, and his word is not in us. So hallelujah is we can be forgiven when we blow it and come short. But with your idols, you can't. There's no forgiveness from an idol. Maybe your idol this morning is perfectionism. I meet that daily. I don't even know what that feels like. I was an underachiever. <coughs> perfectionism. And, and, and it's just, that's all you can think about. And then you just, your whole life, I'm just a perfectionist and I want to do everything perfect. And then you get saved and you bring that into your walk with God. And every time you fail, you can't forgive yourself. <laughs> Number one thing I counsel, you can't forgive yourself because you're a perfectionist. And I came short of trying to please my God. Your idol will not let you up from failure. Your perfectionism is killing you. Instead of this glorious Christ who forgives when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And I'm going to go fishing. Maybe your idol is your family. All I've ever wanted is a family that just gets along and loves each other. Anybody want that? <laughs> Anybody have that? Jesus said, I'm going to come bring a sword into families. I don't want a sword. I just want to leave it to Beaver. Sorry, younger guys. I don't even know a modern day thing. And I'll tell you this. If they don't, I can't function. My whole life is a failure if they don't. I'm anxious. And I'm up all night. And I can't feel any peace. That's your functional idol. And some of you got them here this morning. And I want to give you something better. Maybe your idol was you just wanted to be accepted. That was my whole goal my whole life, was to just fit in. And when I feel anything close to that, that hurts it. I can't handle it. Rejection is the one thing I just can't handle. And when I do, I blow up. Or I just run from people. I cannot handle being rejected. There's no body causing the growth of the body because my idol is I can't be hurt and I've been hurt and I'm going to stay out of this no matter what you say, Pastor, from Ephesians 4. You can keep begging and getting feisty, but I can't do it because I have this idol. God, I can't be rejected. I cannot be hurt. I, I cannot obey the command of God then. I have to smash this. Your identity is you are in the inner circle of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you are accepted. And if no one else ever accepts you the rest of your life, you have everything. That'll break that idol. Or you can, be, you can overcome this. I got ten more, but I'm out of time. And, and they're all from my own life, so I didn't even have to go digging except in my own heart. So hear this. God and the place that he was for John, it gives you your life back. You've, you've been made for God. You've been made to love him and to love others. And when you know this Christ and this gospel, you get your life back from all these idols that have been destroying your life and making you miserable and just one after another. This is how you get your life back. And now you, you're free to love like no other. You can actually do Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. You can keep the unity of the Spirit by having humility and forbearance and love with each other because your idols have been smashed. It will make you a worshiper of God. 
in spirit and in truth. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere when Christ is in his right place. So I'm telling you this morning, verse 21 is not changing the subject. But it's the truth and the fulfillment of all that John has been writing in this glorious, beautiful epistle of 1 John. And so as one great saint wrote, Jesus, make yourself to me a living, bright reality, more present to face vision keen than any outward object seen. The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Amen? Amen. Let me pray and we'll close. Father, I thank you for the beauty of uh, what you did in the Apostle John. I thank you for the beauty that he got to touch and behold and walk with, see the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you that we get to hear his testimony, that we can have the same fellowship with Christ, that we can lay at the bosom of Christ. I thank you for how near you bring us now by your Spirit and this work of redemption and salvation. God, I pray that we'll be honest with the idols of our heart, the idols that are ruining relationship with you and relationship with others. God, our whole life is just a picture of these idols hurting and breaking our lives, and we want our lives back. I want to be like that man who was crazy gashing himself, and it says now he's seated at the feet of Jesus in his right mind. God, make all of us that this morning, just seated at the feet of Christ in our right minds with him at the center of our life the center of this universe and the healing that comes from having Christ in that place. God, let us throw down every idol and behold the one that should have supreme affection in our hearts, the beautiful Lord Jesus Christ. Let him be put on display and worshiped and honored here this morning. God, I pray for any who have false idols of the idol of unbelief, the ones who are still looking to find that, that void in their heart and something here in this world, I pray today would be the end of their journey. And right now they would just bow before you and cry out, give me living water. Break into my heart that it's so thirsty and it's thirsty for Jesus Christ and all these false idols have not helped. God, give them eyes to see and a heart to call upon you this morning and be saved. God, I thank you for this and it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.